of America Audio with your host, Tim Benall. Hello out there, my friends. This is Tim Benall of BenallofAmerica.com with another edition of BOA Audio Season 3. It is November 17th, 2007, and this week we have literally a very special episode for you. It is our first theme episode of the season. As we covered at BOA in early October, I was lucky enough to be in attendance at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash, which is essentially the biggest paranormal conference in the New England area. We covered it in depth in text form at the BOA website, but of course what you're here for is the audio interviews that we captured on site during the big esoteric double bill. So we're going to keep the intro short and sweet this week. Here's the rundown of guests in order. Lauren Coleman, Chris Balzano, Don Keating, Carl Feint, Don Ledger, and Chris Stiles. We'll have little intros for each of the guests, but we're going to askew the normal biographies that we usually do at the beginning of the program. You can find all the great bio information on the guests at their appropriate websites, so we'll be plugging their websites throughout the show. With the exception of the Don Keating portion of the program, these interviews were recorded over the weekend of October 12th and 13th on location at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash. So without any further ado, let's rock and roll. We're going to kick it off here first with Lauren Coleman talking about the Dover Demon case, the Bridgewater Triangle, the Virginia Tech shootings, and tons and tons more. It is the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash special on BOA Audio Season 3. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here on location at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash. Uh, We're on the first night here. Lauren Coleman's here. I've been hanging out with him for the afternoon. I don't know, Lauren. Let's start out. What are you here to present at the Mass Monster Mash? Well, I'm going to be here to present just specifically on the Dover Demon case, that case in April of 1977, when four individuals over the space of 21 hours saw this creature from who knows where. Sounds exciting. How about a little update? We had you on the show um, about a year and a half ago at this point, uh, April of 05 or something like that. Um, How about a little update? What's going on in the Bigfoot world in the last year or so? Uh, How's it look? Is it promising? Is it unpromising? I've seen some various type video rumors going on, but you never know what that kind of thing. But give us a little update on the Bigfoot scene. Well, I think at that time there was a lot of interest coming out of Malaysia, and that's really died down quite a bit. Uh, There was a hoax over there that really kind of put to rest a lot of interest. But what's occurred since then is there's been many reports from Native American reservations out west, and that's got people excited because what's occurred is the uh, tribal police have actually done some thermal imaging of the Bigfoot, and they're trying to uh, convert that to ways in which we can analyze it a little bit more. So we're uh, excited by that. Now, oh, yeah, I I did a little, I was telling you about how I did a little investigation into the uh, Bridgewater Triangle, and and, uh, you're kind of credited with naming the Bridgewater Triangle. So talk about the Bridgewater Triangle, what it is, and sort of how you came upon the whole thing and and sort of put it all together and, and crystallized it as the Bridgewater Triangle. Well, I grew up in the Midwest, and when I was there and writing my book, Mysterious America, uh, in the early 70s, I started noticing that there's certain places that have specific names that both the locals, either the natives or the colonial-type people, would name because it was sinister, and it's often the devil names in 40 and places was the title of my article. Uh, Then I moved to New England in 1975, and what I discovered was there's this concentrated area in southeast Massachusetts around the Bridgewaters that had a lot of reports, and so I actually saw that there were three Bridgewaters there. There's the east, west, and Bridgewater, and I saw it 
was a natural triangle. But what really was happening was there's an extended area, 200 square mile area, that forms a triangle. So I started calling it the Bridgewater Triangle. And there were all kinds of reports, UFO reports, uh, missing people reports, strange crimes, uh, Black Panthers, Bigfoot, uh, giant snakes from the CCC days. And I really decided that by using the name the Bridgewater Triangle, people could start associating all of this phenomena with one area and then be able to talk to me in a clearer fashion. So the word actually helped. And then I wrote an article for Boston Magazine uh, and d did some lectures in different areas. And, and it just kind of stuck. There you go. There you go. Maybe talk a little bit about the Dover Demon for people who don't know what okay. it is and that kind of thing. So uh, we'll sort of catch them up on that. Well, the Dover Demon was seen in April 77, as I mentioned, and what occurred was this individual in his car with some buddies was driving along Farm Street, and all of a sudden along this stone fence, he noticed a creature that was about four feet tall, except it was down on all fours. It had long, spindly fingers, very thin body, no mouth, and just two huge glowing orange eyes. And this guy had a photographic memory. He's now today, you know, some 30 years later, he's a, a well-known artist around the area. But he went home immediately that night. He was, you know, just a teenager. And he painted and he drew this thing because he was obsessed with it. Almost a close encounter, so the third kind of an obsession. And what occurred later that night, another individual 1.1 uh, mile away, I uh, was in another part of Dover, and they saw this thing walking down the road, and they thought it was a high school buddy <laughs> with a large head. <laughs> so he kept yelling out, hey, MJ, MJ, is that you? And it wasn't him. The creature actually ran away, went into a gully, then went up and leaned against a tree, and its glowing eyes were looking out at it. He went home and did a drawing, too. These guys didn't know each other had had the sighting, and uh, then a few hours later, a couple in a car saw a thing crossing a road with also this kind of egg-shaped, I mean, a uh, figure-eight head. And what was different about this is the woman in that instant said that the glowing eyes was green and not orange. What happened was a couple days later, I noticed at the Dover Country Store that there was this drawing that this woman that was working there was looking at, and I said, what's that about? She, she knew that I'd written a book and uh, was interested in Creatures of the Outer Edge was the book that I, I had read, written. And so she uh, said, gave me the name of the person, and I went. And what happened is I very quickly interviewed all the principals, yeah. found that they had contaminated each other by talking to each other yet. Yeah. And yet I wanted to do another round of interviews, and so I got in Walter Webb and some MUFON people who had expertise in interviewing from the UFO area, because there aren't that many cryptozoologists around the block. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so uh, yet I wanted people that were open to something that was unusual and something that was, uh, you know, needed some in-depth interviews, because what we did, we interviewed uh, teachers, parents, police officers, Everybody in the community in a wider circle from those individual eyewitnesses to get some credibility checks oh, on those yeah. four witnesses. And we really built up a rather large case file on it, on something that, that didn't seem to be connected to anything. Yeah. Uh, we really couldn't. There were no UFOs involved. There was no uh, you know, cattle mutilations. There was nothing that we might see in other cryptozoological or ufological or paranormal or hauntings. It just seemed the Dover Demon showed up. I also came up with the name Dover Demon to give it a file name, and I like alliteration, and so all of that. And so that name also uh, has stuck. It stuck so well, the update really is that in Japan, they make little figures of the Dover Demon. Uh, this artist, uh, the, one of the eyewitnesses, Bill Bartlett, is now, uh, you know, he's shown art in some of the galleries and, and the institutions around the Boston area. And he, in, in fact, really can't figure out what the Dover Demon was. And he sometimes gets upset because why do people remember me for the Dover Demon yeah. when, in fact, yeah. you know, 
know I want to be much more known for my art. So uh, that's kind of the update. Nice, nice. Now, was this just like a one one time type of thing, one isolated incident? Did it turn into any kind of wave, or have you ever seen uh, anything like this coming from anywhere else? You know, have you you know you, someone comes to you and they're like, you got to hear about the Tallahassee demon. It's the you know <laughs> that kind of thing, or is it uh, like a one off type of incident? It seems to be a one time incident. Uh, the original witness a year later had an incident where he was making out with a girlfriend, and he thought he saw the Dover Demon out of his peripheral vision, but he very quickly said to himself, that wasn't the Dover Demon. <laughs> There's some people in the UFO field that have tried to associate this with uh, a, a fake film, uh, a fake photograph from Chile. There are some people that said it's related to the Chupacabra. It's not like it at all. Other individuals have tried to associate with mer beings. So there's always people coming along saying the Dover Demon fits here or fits there. And I still see it as really extremely separate, uh, very unique, and has no connection with anything else. Okay. All right. And uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is we had you all, like I said, we had you on the show, and we talked a lot about the copycat effect. I'm a huge fan of the book, and I'm really uh, interested in that other aspect of your work. Everyone, you know, you're a cryptozoology superstar, but I also... I also follow your work in the other realm, in the suicide cluster realm and that kind of thing. And uh, we had talked about a year and a half ago, right? I, I don't know if it was after that. No, it was about last year or so. It was about a year later was the Virginia Tech shooting. And then, and I sort of noticed that there seemed to be sort of a dangerous new trend that came up now with the guy who shot all the, all the people in Virginia Tech, uh, sending the videos and stuff after he had died, or right before he went on the shooting spree. And, and from what I can recall from your blog, uh, Copycat Effect, was that, you know, you thought that was kind of a dangerous thing for them to be showing that on TV, and you don't want to sort of start this new trend of shooters, you know, trying to have their, leave their mark or, or make some kind of crazy statement, and they think they're going to become famous through doing this, that kind of thing. Um, I guess just talk a little bit about the Virginia Tech shooting and that whole callback situation that happened after the fact. Well, I think what's intriguing to me about the whole Virginia Tech is that, in fact, if you look at the fall of 2005, there were between six and nine shootings that came to the attention of the media. So what I started finding is that there's this trend that happens. If there's shootings in the fall, you're going to have a hot spring. So what I did was I predicted the Virginia Tech shooting down to the week. I said it was probably going to be somebody that was really outside of the norm, not a Caucasian, uh, somebody that would actually pick that week, the Columbine week. And here we had it happen. So there were several things going on. And then, as you say, in my blog, uh, The Copycat Effect, I really uh, challenged NBC News for what they did. Here they gave a platform. This kid wanted to shoot up people, and he wanted to live after he killed himself. And he was able to do it by producing videos and becoming a media star uh, after he died. And I thought it was irresponsible. I thought it fe feeds right into the copycat effect. After Virginia Tech, what happens because of all the grieving, you're not going to get an immediate effect right then. But I think we're already seeing it now in the fall of 2007. The Cleveland shooting. Uh, here is an individual who was a little separate from the culture, uh, a Caucasian male in an African-American school, a goth, Columbine style. There's absolutely nothing wrong with goth people, and I think I've been very clear in my writings about that. But what's happened, there's now a subculture of goth, goth individuals that are the Columbine death cult, and they are definitely copycats of the original Columbine, down to the trench coat, down to the black fingernail polish, down to speaking you know, German, and all of those kinds of things are there. Um, now, last I heard, uh, last spring, you had uh, re-released Mysterious America, updated, expanded, all that good stuff. Um, now here it is October. What's what's coming up on the horizon for you? What do you have that people can pick up? And, and what are you looking forward to in the near and distant future? 
well, there's always books inside of me and I need to <laughs> write more books. So it's, uh, there's, there's different things on the horizon. For instance, I figure right now my Tom Slick book is under a movie option. So I'm always hopeful in three years or five years, uh, Hollywood will make the Tom Slick Yeti movie. I'm also uh, going to redo the, the Mothman book and make it much more evil because I think there's a sinister evil underpinning that is not just cryptozoological, and people need to look at that. So the, the Mothman death curse really was something that I uh, researched after my Mothman book in 2002, so I'm really revamping the whole Mothman book. I, I know that there's no movie coming out, but I think that there's always going to be interest in the Mothman now. And there's other little projects uh, on the horizon, so it's uh, just always something's happening. Awesome, awesome. And people can follow your stuff at Cryptomundo.com, correct? Definitely. Cryptomundo.com. And we just, I guess, heard this week that we're the number one cryptozoology site in the world with over 200 million hits per month. That's not too hard to believe because it is, uh, it's the best crypto, cryptozoological website out there. So I check it out every day. So I highly recommend people check it out if they're, I'm sure they are. If they're listening to me and Lauren Holman talk, they know about crypto mundo. So, hey, Lauren, thank you so much for taking down and talk to me here. And yeah, let me, let me drag you outside and <laughs> to do the interview. I had a great time talking to you. Good luck with the presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing you here and go Red Sox. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to ask you. What do you think about the Red Sox? How is it going to turn out? Well, I think it's going to be a hard series, but at the end, the Red Sox will come through. <laughs> Thank all right. you for the interview. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. There you go. That was Lauren Coleman talking about all sorts of great stuff. Big thanks to Lauren Coleman for taking some time out of his busy weekend there to talk with us here on BOA Audio. Of course, you can find out more information on Lauren Coleman at the website www.cryptomundo.com, C-R-Y-P-T-O-M-U-N-D-O.com. Up next is Chris Balzano of the Massachusetts Paranormal Crossroads. Chris is a good guy, good friend of mine here in the local area. He's got quite a few books coming out in 2008, and I am definitely pegging him as one of the breakout stars in the world of esoterica in 08. So without any further ado, here's Chris Balzano from the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the uh, Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash with... Chris Balzano, my good friend, we had quite an adventure exploring the Bridgewater Triangle, and uh, he's here for the weekend. He's got a lot of good stuff on the horizon coming out. Uh, for starters, Chris, uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing here at the Mass Monster Mash, other than rubbing elbows and networking with folks like me. Uh, I'll actually be acting as the uh, co-host of the event. Um, I'll be introducing uh, Jeff Bellinger uh, from GhostVillage.com and Karen Mossy, who's an EVP specialist. Who's worked? Uh, whose work has appeared in the movie uh, White Noise and in the Ghost Whisperer, and, and she's, uh, I guess you could say, almost kind of like a, a family friend. So I'll be introducing her as well. Nice, nice. Now, like I alluded to, you have a lot coming up on the horizon. You've sort of carved out quite a niche here in the Massachusetts area for your work and stuff like that. So talk a little bit about what your main, you know, what your main specialization is, so people who are starting to get to know you can find out more. Um, well, what I really, when I originally uh, started my website, launched my website, its title was uh, Massachusetts Ghosts and Legends, and it was really meant to kind of look at the connection between a lot of the hauntings that people were reporting, things like that, and also some of the great urban legends and legends that were coming out of the Massachusetts area. I eventually uh, changed the name to Crossroads uh, because I like to think that a lot of the hauntings people are experiencing and a lot of the legends people report live in that crossroads. Some of them are, are more legend than, than haunting and some of them are more haunting than legend, but uh, the fun is in deciding you know which end of the spectrum that they're on and, and most of them are right there in the crossroads. Um, so I really just began kind of uh, reporting some of the legends I had heard and some of the hauntings I had personally experienced. Uh, and then it just kind of uh, blossomed from there. I've been at it. Uh, I launched my website in 2001, um, and I've been investigating since uh, 94. And so uh, it's it's really I, I've carved a niche out as uh, a Bridgewater Triangle guy in a south uh, eastern Massachusetts hauntings person, which is about an hour and a half away from <laughs> from me in, in Woburn. Uh, but I'm getting a lot more local stuff and and due to writing and, and connections that I have, working on a lot more uh, a lot more books and material that's kind of covering all hauntings and legends across the country. So that's the exciting part of what I'm doing now is uh, I'm kind of expanding from just a Massachusetts person to uh, more of a United States uh, and seeing the same things that we see here in Massachusetts all over the country, which, which all of a sudden starts to make it lean more towards the legend and urban legend side uh, than maybe 
genuine hauntings. There you go. There you go. So Valzano's taking America by storm. <laughs> finally. <laughs> it's like I've got. Um, I've got one coming out. Uh, I actually just checked last night. Uh, I am officially listed on Amazon uh, for a book entitled Ghostly Adventures, which uh, takes uh, takes me across the entire United States tracking down some hauntings and some personal uh, first-hand experiences. Um, and then I, uh, I have something else in the works, which also will be mo- much more of a, a, a United States. But I, I still love the Boston stuff. I still love the Massachusetts stuff. And, and I'd, I'd love to be able to, to work on both things at the same time. There you go. There you go. I guess talk a little bit about the Bridgewater Triangle, because uh, like I said, you know, you and me were running around there uh, back in April, causing trouble and stuff like that, and hassling the cops and the tow truck drivers and <laughs> all kinds of fun stuff like that. So uh, uh, bring people up to speed on the Bridgewater Triangle, uh, and, and you know what it's all about, and your experiences exploring it. Sure. Uh, one of the one of the things that I uh, that I did when I first started was I started to contact as many people as I could find. Uh, and part of the reason I started the website was there wasn't a lot of Massachusetts-specific stuff. This was kind of before the explosion of TAPS. Uh, so there were areas covered, like there was you know, the New England Paranormal Research and, and all that kind of stuff, but nothing Massachusetts-specific. And so I made the site and then tried to contact as many local people as possible. And the, one of them that I found was Chris Pittman, um, who actually I had worked with at a, at a sub shop uh, for a little while that my sister owned. And so I automatically emailed him, and reading his site discovered this 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 vast uh, uh, vortex of energy called the Bridgewater Triangle, which uh, Chris and, and Lauren Coleman have written on a lot having to do with uh, cryptozoology and UFO reports and black helicopters. Um, and I started to kind of make the connection between that and a lot of the ghost hauntings uh, I had, kind of starting with the red-headed hitchhiker of uh, Route 44 and a lot of hauntings and, and stories mentioned in the New England Ghost Files. Um, which were my first inspirations to go out in the field and search for something as opposed to reporting just things that had happened to me. Um, and so I'd start just to really collect a lot of ghost stories. And, of course, once you collect one and you post it, then all of a sudden people begin to find you. And I started to, to see that the same things that were happening in terms of, um, of, of cryptozoology and Bigfoot sightings and Thunderbirds, there was also a heightened level of paranormal activity in terms of ghosts. So I'd really kind of focus myself on what are the ghosts. My, the book that I'm just finishing up now, which hopefully will be out next Halloween is Ghosts of the Bridgewater Triangle. And that is just an account of all of these crazy stories. And if, and if I asked, I, you know, for an extension, I could probably get, you know, 20 more stories because they seem to be coming in every day. Um, and it's just, you know, and I've actually expanded the Bridgewater Triangle, kind of, um, you know, finding Lauren Coleman's definition excellent for what he was doing, and yet limited in terms of, well, why can't the Triangle cross state lines? Yeah. Because, you know, if you just kind of follow that natural trail, well, first of all, Rehoboth, which, I mean, uh, Freetown, which is one of the apexes, is actually, was originally, Freetown was originally part of Rhode Island, or I should say Rhode Island was part of Freetown. Um, so I just kind of hopped the fence, went over there, and I started saying, well, you know, if you extend those lines, you've got Newport, you've got Providence. So I, so I decided it was, uh, and, and it's staying the same way if you go west and if you go a little bit more uh, towards uh, Boston Harbor, you start seeing a little bit more. I mean, where do you cut it off is difficult. Um, but I've kind of expanded it to include especially uh, southeastern towns uh, such as New Haven, I mean, uh, Fairhaven, New Bedford, Fall River, all those towns which have probably the most uh, documented hauntings. Hobbits is probably the most haunted town, but uh, really New Bedford, Fall River are, are probably the most haunted areas that, that people openly talk about the ghosts that are there. So I decided to include those as well. Now, you say you do a lot of uh, field-type work and that kind of thing. What's some of the wild and weird stuff that's happened? Because, um, you know, a lot of times when you go looking for something like that, you don't get anything. And then next, you know, but then when you're driving to get milk, you know, right. a ghost will cross the front of your car. So talk a little bit about, you know, kind of weird stuff that might have happened on your I mean, explorations. Probably the, the most activity that I've encountered that we've been able to document uh, is a house in a cushion, which is kind of a, an extension of New Bedford. And I've investigated there with uh, Matt Moniz uh, from Spooky South Coast, Tom D'Agostino who is uh, an author, actually with the same publisher that I am. He, he haunted Rhode Island, haunted New Hampshire, haunted Massachusetts, and his wife, Arlene. And um, Mike Markowitz, who is an EVP specialist actually in Bridgewater. He's kind of in the, in the, in the, ver- in the heart of the storm. And um, we have gotten so much EVP evidence from there that it's <clears throat> the clearest EVPs I've ever heard, constant talking. It really kind of opens this whole new uh, idea into the paranormal because there are... 
uh, seems like levels of like there's a hierarchy of uh, spirits that are that are there that talk to one another, or uh, there's even some that seem to discipline. Uh, so there seems to be children who make themselves very vocal, and then adults who kind of tell them to shut up, um, and very clearly say, you know, they're recording this. Um, they know all of us by name, and it seems every time we leave there that the house suffers kind of a week and a half to two weeks of increased activity, uh, almost as if that's it, that's all you want to talk, bring in, you know, either bring in more people or now you guys talk to us. Um, probably the, one of the, the oddest things from that, and, and I believe all the members of the family when they talk and tell me the stories, um, is that the, pers- the tenant who lives on the second floor who's, you know, seen most of the haunting or heard most of the, of the haunting, he's kind of the, it's really at the active center of the house um, kind of challenged one of the spirits why do you want to talk to these you know these ghost hunters that come in but you won't talk to me are you scared of me and we had told him when we first went in there um, to put talcum powder as kind of you know a very low tech way of monitoring things and he went up a little while later and yes was written in the talcum powder um, so whether that's true, whether he went up there and did it himself, I don't get the feeling that that's what happened. And so every time we leave there, there's increased activity. And I, I actually kind of get the feeling that it's maybe turned a little bit dark, uh, that especially with the use of these children who are running up and down the stairs, uh, something darker might be trying to gain entrance. So we're trying to get back there and do follow-ups. It's just a very difficult time of the year to, to do that. Um, but, you know, the, the Bridgewater Triangle has this reputation of drawing negativity to it. Uh, it kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with Lorne Coleman's whole uh, what's in a name, uh, you know, places that are named after the devil or, or, or variants of the devil, Fay, Fayetteville, things like that have this weird haunting aspect to them or this weird energy aspect to him. Um, Hockamock is also related to the devil. It's also named for the devil. And so um, there's this weird energy that's there. And, you know, you, you can't necessarily, uh, you know, record it or put it in a box. But um, I've had several negative encounters being there. In addition to time slips, I think I've experienced on, on Route 79, um, driving there late at night. Um, one time, you know, I called my wife to say I was on my way home. I was just leaving kind of what's officially the triangle. Uh, she called me up five minutes later to say she had fallen down a flight of stairs and her foot had gone, her leg actually had gone through glass on the, on the bottom of the stairs. Um, maybe you know about this, but my car got stuck in a ditch <laughs> down there. Uh, a, few, a few days later, um, I got a, a, a deer tick that actually traveled all the way up my belly button and had to be surgically removed by a doctor. Oh, um, I destroyed one car driving uh, on Copacut Road. I just have had these uh, things that every time I seem to go out there, uh, whether it's for a, sh- you know, a radio show or an appearance or whether it's just to actually do an investigation, something bad happens to me or, or, if, or my wife. So can you, can you look at that and say, ah, it's just coincidence. Okay, well, how many coincidences make a pattern? Because it seems to me you know, that it's, uh, we can joke about it and laugh about it, but there is something darker there which seems to either follow you or kind of enter your life the more you investigate. And, and Chris Bittman can tell you that more than anyone else because he's taken a step back because of, because of that darkness kind of entering his life as well. So, Scary stuff. That's some <laughs> scary stuff. Uh, now, talk. Uh, let's hit on the clown phenomenon okay. because I saw some stuff here on a website there with, uh, with you and the clown phenomenon, and yep. I'm dying to know because clowns are kind of scary, and I'm afraid of where this is going to go. Sure. In, uh, I believe it was um, May of 82... Or Mayor 81, I can't believe, remember exactly which one it is. Uh, they're out of Boston. There started to be these uh, weird clown reports where uh, people dressed up as clowns were abducting children, uh, were attacking people on the streets, were causing all this kind of may- uh, you know this this uh, all this mayhem all over the town uh, city. Um, and there wasn't one actual single reported case. But for some reason, the Boston police actually put out a bulletin to to be careful of these clowns. And uh, Lauren Coleman reports that this was happening in several different cities, major cities in the United States at the same time, all of them with no actual reported instances. But But the craze just kind of hit first Boston and then its suburbs, and I was living in Everett at the time. Um, and I remember uh, my my cousin and I making signs that said, beware of the clowns, and holding them up to the cars as they went by. And I'm constantly getting emails from people saying, I remember that. I remember we were scared about the clowns. Every time before we went out, we'd have to tell our parents, no, we will not talk to clowns. I mean, in some of the stories were just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, someone with a clown mask and nothing 
else on with machine guns and any, any kind of variant of of of, uh, of scary thing, axes and, and chainsaws, and all, and they were being reported as uh, by little kids as well. And so these little kids were reporting it. People were connecting it because they had heard a police report about it, and so it was given more weight, and it just kind of traveled across the country. It uh, you know, sparked up in different places and spread across the country. And a lot of people say, ah, Pennywise must have had something to do with it. And actually, I believe that it was probably some uh, inspired in part by this kind of clown phenomenon because it was published after that. But what did happen was, that happened in May, in February of that same year, John Wayne Gacy was convicted and sentenced to die. And John Wayne Gacy was a killer out in Ohio, I believe, one of one of the Midwestern towns, um, who, uh, you know, brutally murdered, raped and murdered dozens of, of teenage and, and early 20s boys, probably one of the most famous serial killers. And every time they mention him, boop, they p- throw up that big... Uh, Pozo the Clown, or Pogo the Clown, I think is what it was. He, in his free time, would dress up as a clown and go to charity events. And, and I think that really that image of John Wayne Gacy as serial killer and clown stuck with people. And so when they heard these whispers, it really kind of made, made, ah, made sense to them. Yeah, yeah, remember that guy? That, yeah, yeah, I heard something about that, which is how all great urban legends start. I heard something about that. Um, and so it, it's, and you know, it's not dead either because, I mean, I teach high school. And one of the, uh, you know, we were talking about urban legends and, and hauntings and things like that, which I often do in my class. And some of the kids said, yeah, no, actually, that's real. And I said, well, okay, <laughs> beautiful, great. And whenever I hear that, I'm like, all right, I'm going to get another kind of add-on to the story. And he's like, no, that's real because in our school, which is, um, which is Robert Frost Middle School, behind there, there's some graffiti. It's like so the satanic graffiti. And all the kids, and this goes back, you know, more than two decades. Well, not more than, yeah, but more than two decades report that there were, and still are, uh, ghost clowns out there who abduct kids, take them out there, you know, do all kinds of nasty things to them and then kill them. And if you go back there, you'll either be, like, strangled by the kids whose spirits are left there or by the killer clowns themselves. Um, and I spoke with a, a person who teaches at that school and who had been there, has been there for years. She's, she's actually now an administrator. And she said, you know, oh, yeah, everyone knows that story. It's a great, you know, all good schools have to have a good urban legend attached to them. And, um, you know, or a good, really good haunting. And she, I said, well, do you remember it before? 81, 82, 83? She's like, I really first remember it in 85. But from 85 to 2007, you know, with different generations coming in, and more importantly, different uh, people with different ethnic backgrounds and different immigration uh, cycles, the story has still been kept alive. And it still rings true because we're still scared of clowns. All schools are still haunted, you know, and woods are scary. Exactly. So it's, it's, you know, the, the, the story itself and the variants all kind of play on the, all the classic things that we're, haunt, that we're scared of. So you got the book coming out in February, so probably people can pre-order it. So how can people go about uh, grabbing the new book? Uh, you know, give us the title, give us the website to pick it up, and of course, plug your website. Sure. Uh, my website is www.masscrossroads.com, uh, and that's Massachusetts Paranormal Crossroads. And there'll be a link up to to both Schiffer and Amazon, and, and some other ways to, to buy the books. Right now, you can pre-order Dark Woods, uh, which is about the Freetown State Forest, um, and the act- a lot of the activity there and connections. Like we've been talking about those that multi multi-faceted aspect of the triangle um, by going to shifferbooks.com um, or just Google Schiffer um, Schiffer Books and, and you can take you there or uh, you can actually go to Amazon.com uh, and you can order pre-order um, Ghostly Adventures, which is the the one that's more about the United States. So the release date on that, according to Amazon, is July. So I was told maybe earlier than that, but that's what Amazon has listed as. All right, all right. Well, hey, thank you so much for doing the interview and let me drag you outside to do it and all that good <laughs> stuff. And once the uh, once the books get rolling, get in touch with me. You live literally like five minutes right. from my house, so so uh, yeah, get in touch with me and we'll have you on the show for you know a full blown super episode. You know, a big Excellent. sit down without the wind and <laughs> <laughs> coffee and all that good stuff interview. So hey, thanks a lot and thank thanks for much. taking me out to the Bridgewater Triangle last year. It was a good time. And I uh, look for forward to along, Tim. <laughs> further adventures between the two of us. Excellent, me too. So we'll talk as soon as the, hopefully before the books come out. So definitely, definitely. There you go. That was Chris Balzano, folks. Keep an eye on him. He is going to be one of the big names coming to the surface in the world of esoterica. 
in 2008. You can find out more on him at masscrossroads.com, M-A-S-S-C-R-O-S-S-R-O-A-D-S.com. Up next is Don Keating to talk about the White Bigfoot and Ohio cryptozoology. After our original recording was damaged by tremendous winds as we taped it outside, Don was cool enough to sit down and talk with me this past weekend on November 11th to pretty much recapture the interview that we did at the Triple M conference. So without any further ado, here's Don Keating. Ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, not on location at the Mass Monster Mash, Mass UFO show. We're doing a little post-show interview here with Don Keating. We actually taped one at the event, but we were really uh, felled by some awful wind that was going on. That's the problem when you tape uh, an interview on the outside of the building, I guess, but uh, live and learn, I suppose. And thankfully, Don Keating has been really cool enough to uh, sit down and talk to me here a little bit so we can do a little touch base and, and not uh, excise him from the special. And Don Keating is from the Eastern Ohio Bigfoot Investigation Center. You can find them at eobic.com. Don, thanks for uh, taking some time here to uh, catch up from the conference. No, no problem, Tim. Uh, for starters, I guess just share with people, uh, you know, what you were presenting on at the conference and uh, talk a little bit about your presentation for the folks who uh, couldn't make it but are listening to the special to get the scoop. All right. Well, what I did at the conference was uh, I gave a talk on a couple of uh, pieces of videotape that I've shot over the years. One was in August of 1992 in western Coshocton County, Ohio. This was a piece of uh, videotape that I uh, shot purely by accident. Uh, it's an individual walking down the road, a country road, that uh, appears to be a rather tall, light-colored individual. And many people who have seen the videotape over the years believe this could be the uh, image of a light-colored Sasquatch creature. Uh, in April of 1995, within a couple of hundred yards of the same location of August 92, I shot another piece of videotape. Uh, this was when six or seven individuals were located in, again, the western Coshocton County doing research. And this was a little longer piece of tape. Uh, the image of a light-colored individual, once again, was walking down a grass trail. And you can not only see the individual walking on the trail, but you could see the reflection of it in this body of water. And that's what I did. I basically presented those two pieces of videotape. Uh, John Horgan has been a good friend of mine for several years, and he has been very intrigued by these video clips and thought it would be interesting to have me present them to the attendees at the Mass Monster Mash, which I was more than happy to do. So that's what I did. And um, I've never said that these pieces of videotape ever show a... Uh, a Bigfoot type creature, so to speak, because I don't know what they are, but uh, the they are they are quite intriguing to say the least. Definitely, definitely. I was stunned when I was seeing those videos at the conference. They were just amazing. Talk a little bit about the white Bigfoot, because a lot of people obviously are are uh, you know they're familiar with the classic Bigfoot, um, but I was pretty surprised that there is this white Bigfoot. And uh, I guess talk a little bit about the white Bigfoot. How you uh, sort of came became first interested in the in the white Bigfoot aspect of the Bigfoot phenomenon and um, you know, how prevalent is this white Bigfoot? And, uh, you know, share some information on that with us. Well, I first became involved in a uh, white Bigfoot uh, because of a sighting that I myself had had back in September of 1985. I was doing active field research at a location just south of Newcomerstown, Ohio. And um, since then, I, uh, you know, I've done the typical research on Bigfoot encounters or Bigfoot track discoveries, but I've also had a very keen interest, more so than usual, probably in the reports of the light-colored or white-colored Sasquatch creatures, uh, not only because of my own sighting, but because of the clips of videotape that I've shot. Uh, I think there are uh, more more to, uh, more to light-colored creatures out there than what people tend to think. The typical description has always been a, a black or a dark hair colored creature mm -hmm. standing seven to nine feet tall. And uh, because of my own sighting in 85 and then the subsequent uh, videotapes that were shot in 92 and 95, I've just had a very keen interest in the light colored creature. And um, there have been more reports of light colored individuals than what uh, the general public might think. Yeah, and we had a, we kind of had a little laugh about it because uh, I was talking about how 
back when I was watching the cartoons, I thought the only white Bigfoot was the abominable snowman. <laughs> yeah. Is this white Bigfoot, is it a geographical anomaly, you know, where it's only sort of seen in certain parts of the country, or is it sort of just run with the rest of the Bigfoot pack well, wherever they're found? Well, it's it's um, not just in the Midwestern part of the U.S., but other parts of North America as well. Um there have been reports of like colored creatures from all corners of North America and that's what's very intriguing. The question has to come up, you know, is this genetic? Is it uh, al albin albinism? You know, is it an albino creature? Um, is it because they're getting old and they start to turn gray or white in color? Um, it's There are several questions regarding the like colored Sasquatch creatures that have been seen and of course to this point in time we don't have any specific answers but only to theorize and speculate as to what it may be. And and you said that you were shooting the film footage uh, on two different occasions in the same areas. Now is this like a notorious Bigfoot area for sightings in Ohio or because I think you may be talking about the Bigfoot Triangle, right? Right. Uh, there had been a lot of activity, uh, tracked discoveries and sightings reported in these geographical locations. And in fact, it is in the, uh, the midst of what is known as the Sasquatch Triangle in East Central Ohio. Uh, we had been in that location for, uh, two or three years at the time, uh, in 1992. We first started going out there in, uh, 1989, May of 89. And so we had been in the one location for just over three years, and that's when the videotape was shot in August of 89, or August of 92. So, yeah, it's um, the one geographical location in Ohio is the most active. And you, if you take a map and you draw uh, three pinpoint locations from Newcomerstown, Ohio, southwestward toward Conesville, Ohio, and then southeastward to Salt Fork State Park, Ohio, uh, you come up with uh, what is known today as the Sasquatch Triangle in Eastern Ohio. I'm benefiting here from uh, hindsight because we originally did the interview before I saw your presentation. One of the things that I found really fascinating is uh, almost a sociological sort of thing. And that's uh, that you said you had put together sort of a group, uh, like a meeting thing for people who are interested in, in looking into the Bigfoot. And you had like 35 people the first time. And then you had another meeting, and then you had 20 people, but the 20 people weren't from the original 35. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that story and the interest that's been generated there in Ohio um, for your research group? Yeah, back in uh, July of 85, we held our first meeting. It was, it was only going to be a one-time event. I wanted to see if people would so to speak, come out of the woodwork so we could get some uh, fresh reports. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people in attendance, I said, how many would be interested in having another meeting? They all raised their hand. Uh, the funny thing, as you said, um, the next meeting, none of those people showed up, but there were brand new faces there. I've been holding meetings on a regular basis since July of 85, and I've been holding an annual Bigfoot conference uh, once a year since uh, March of 1989. And over the years, uh, people of all all uh, professions, you know, have come to the meetings from all across all across North America, the conferences as well, and um, it's one of these things where you've had you know skeptics and believers alike that have come to the conference and the meetings, and you've had eyewitnesses, track discoverers, people who have heard noises and things like this. So it's something uh, that's uh, it's kind of grown on its own. It's uh, as I say about the conference, it's a monster that has evolved on its own. <laughs> and it, um, you know, since 1985, since I held that first meeting, um, I would say we've come close to having eight or 9,000 attendees over the years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like, as you say, you've been doing these meetings since uh, for over 20 years now. How would you say the evolution of Bigfoot research in Ohio has gone in the last 20 years? Because that, that's, that's quite a chunk of time. I'm sure you've seen it change over the years. Uh, what, what's your perspective on how it's grown and changed since the early 80s? Well, the biggest thing, of course, is the advent of the Internet. Um, back in 1984, 85, when I first started Bigfoot research, there were very few groups out there in Ohio. There was only two or three groups at that point in time. And the Internet come along, and then you had Bigfoot groups, you know, organizations popping up, just like weeds during the summer. They, they came out of the ground everywhere. <laughs> and um, – uh, to a certain point in time, it was a good thing, but now I think we're kind of uh, regressing. Uh, I think uh, 
to a point, the advent of the Internet has been a, uh, a deterrent. And as far as Bigfoot research is concerned, and the reason I say that is because to a certain point, you know, you can get all kinds of hoaxers and tricksters uh, getting onto these submission report forms on the Internet and turning in anything. And some organizations and groups, they just take it at face value and they report it to be the gospel, when yeah. in reality it may just be a load of BS. So uh, to a point in the early and mid-90s, the Bigfoot research in Ohio was progressing, but now I think we've kind of stagnated. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think we're at a point now where we're at a crossroads. Something major has to happen or we're just going to continue to spin our wheels, so to speak, until something does happen. And what do you mean major, like a big sighting type of situation, uh, event like that? Yeah, you're going to have to have a major sighting with uh, a number of credible uh, eyewitnesses, um, or you're going to have to come up with some really good uh, physical evidence and as far as a really good series of tracks, some uh, really good hair samples with DNA associated with them, or a part of or a major body, a major part of a body discovered or something to that effect. That's what we all want. <laughs> exactly. Now, let's say if you if you had your druthers and money was no object, um, how would you go about capturing the Bigfoot or, or you know or proving its existence, if you will? Well, uh, I would I would like to get to an area where a lot of activity is current, of course, and then um, I don't you know I don't think we need to really capture one to prove it exists. Uh, if we could get some some really good DNA, you know, off of some hair. Uh, that's non-matchable with anything that we know that exists, so to speak. Uh, we may be a step closer. Uh, but in, and as far as proving without question that it exists to the scientific community and the majority of the general public, um, unfortunately, I think we're at a point where, you know, something has to be brought in, something hardcore, and that hardcore, unfortunately, may have to be a, a part of a body. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part. It's a strange paradox uh, with cryptozoology and, and Bigfoot research in that, you know, to prove it exists may cost us the Bigfoot in a way, you know, because if uh -huh. we if, once they take one down, you know, that's going to bring the crazies out of the woodwork <laughs> yeah. who are going to try and get their own Bigfoot, and it, it's just going to be a nightmare. Uh, we I talked about that with Lauren Coleman once, and uh, he was saying that, you know, perhaps the best case scenario would be if one was taken down by a car or something, like if you would hit one with a car, maybe that would be the safest way to prove it. Uh-huh. I agree. We'll talk a little bit about your radio show here, the Sasquatch Triangle. How can people hear it, and, uh, you know, what's it all about, and, and all that good stuff. The Sasquatch Triangle Radio Talk Show airs uh, Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on uh, Blog Talk Radio. Just go to Blog Talk Radio and enter the Sasquatch Triangle in the search box, and uh, there you'll have the schedule come up. And, of course, whenever the show comes on live, there will be a button there to click on to listen to the show live. And there's also a, uh, a chat room that you can join in on the conversation. Uh, it's becoming a little more active, of course, since winter is around the corner and more and more people are staying in in, in the evenings. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can, if you can't listen to it live, you can always download the shows. Uh, the show has been rather popular, actually. I'm quite surprised because it's, I've only been holding it or hosting it since uh, mid-May of this year, 2007. And on the average, in the past few months, we've uh We've averaged 750 downloads of every show, so. Oh, wow. Nice. That's, that's not too bad, you know. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's good, especially with uh, how many podcasts are out there nowadays and stuff. It's mm -hmm. good to see, like, a Bigfoot-based podcast because there's only a handful of those out there as it is. Mm-hmm. Right. What's coming up for you? What do you, what do you have on the horizon? Um, is there any uh, materials people can get, you know, like books or movies or stuff like that that you have available? And uh, where can people find out more information about you? Obviously, the website, eobic.com, is the Eastern Ohio Bigfoot Investigation Center, but what's coming up next for Don Keating and what can people get from Don Keating that they want to find out more about you and from you? Yeah, as you said, the, the website is the uh, best way of doing it. Uh, go there and you'll see several of my links, uh, including the most recent video documentary that I did, which is available on VHS or DVD. Uh, it contains those images, those two video images I was speaking of earlier, and uh, ordering information is there on the website. Uh, we've got a couple of regular meetings coming up, one on December 8th and then one in March of 2008. 
And then on May 9th, or May 17th of 2008, we will have the 20th annual Bigfoot Conference Expo located at Salt Fork State Park in East Central Ohio, which is just east of Cambridge, Ohio. And uh, that's going to be a, a really good event. Uh, for the past three plus years, uh, we've held the conference there at Salt Fork State Park. And on the average, we've had uh, 330 people uh, every year show up at that conference out there at the park. Oh, wow. That's awesome. 330 is a great number for a conference like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're looking forward with great anticipation as to what the 20th annual conference may uh, may bring. And as far as attendees, as well as, well as uh, speakers, um, we might have a couple of uh, surprises up our sleeve. And we're going to have to wait and see how things progress during the winter months. But uh, we could have a couple of very major speakers. Awesome, awesome. Sounds great. And people can stay tuned to the eobic.com website for more information on that, I presume, right? Definitely. Awesome. Sounds great. Hey, John, thank you so much for taking some time here to catch up with me since the conference and, and being so accommodating and everything in light of uh, the technical difficulties. I really appreciate it. You're a stand-up guy. Uh, I'm really psyched to have met you, and hopefully uh, this is just the beginning of future adventures and, and fun stuff like that uh, for both of us. Well, it sounds good, Tim. It was a pleasure to meet you in Watertown, Mass., and um, looking forward to possible future meetings with you. We may be over there next year for John's uh, third annual Mass Monster Mash, and if we are, hope to cross your path once again. Absolutely, absolutely. There you go, folks. That was Don Keating. Big thanks to Don for being so understanding about the technical difficulties and taking some time to re-record the interview. You can find out more on Don at www.eobic.com. Check it out. Up next, we have Carl Feint telling us all about his work in studying USOs, unidentified submergible objects. This is a fascinating discussion taped on location at the Mass UFO Show. Here you go, folks. Here's Carl Feint. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Bash, and I'm here with the guest, Carl Feint. And he is an expert here on USOs, unidentified submergible objects. Uh, Carl, thanks for taking some time to talk to me here. No problem. Uh, for starters, let's talk about what made you interested in looking into USOs. Well, uh, USOs do things that aircraft can't. A, they can't go into the water, and they definitely can't come out because we don't have engines that function in both mediums. So to me, it was an amazing craft at, that I'd like to find out about. UFOs, of course, are famous. So, you know, everybody knows about UFOs, and then there's USOs that, you know, if you say USO to people, they'll think you misspoke or something. You know, they don't even know you're talking about. So why do you think USOs have remained sort of on the edge of the UFO phenomenon, and, uh, you know, people just, just haven't really heard as much about USOs? Uh, mainly there's something that were held out at uh, arm's length, you know, like they, they really couldn't possibly exist, but they do. As a matter of fact, a rather famous case uh, 40 years ago is Shag Harbor uh, up in Nova Scotia, not far from here. And uh, that is a very famous and uh, uh, documented case. Uh, the medium just hasn't covered it because it's the flying thing that gets all the attention. But it's the same things that fly that go into the water. There's no differentiation really between, it's just an acronym type thing where yeah. you, you specify one from the other. So uh, uh, a water UFO has only lately come to the surface because of the website I put on. Before that, it's just dead, you know, you're just talking surface. You've looked at a lot of USO cases, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that primarily that they are just to stay in the water, or is it they, you know, they come from the sky, go into the water, and then come out of the water and go into the sky? What's, what's your, uh, I guess you could say, what's the, what's the textbook, if you will, USO case? Uh, they do uh, both. As a matter of fact, it's three. Uh, it's space, uh, atmosphere, and water. It makes no difference to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, atmosphere and water are both governed by one physical principle, and that's uh, fluid dynamics. So it really doesn't matter to them. They, they have the engine to do it with, which we don't have, and they have the means of entering without smashing to pieces, uh, which we don't. So uh, it, it's, it's a craft I'm very interested in for that reason. And uh, one of the things that I noticed that you were talking about last night at the presentation was under, underwater bases and that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the underwater bases phenomenon and, and stuff like that. Okay, well, this kind of stems from that book in 1970, which is uh, um, uh, Ivan T. Sanderson's uh, Invisible Residence. 
Uh, in the book, he primarily sorts out the, the UFO uh, water cases, mainly to say there's a civilization residing, coexisting on our planet. And so there's a civilization underwater. It's kind of like the uh, movie a long time ago called The Abyss. But in any event, I don't believe in that. Uh, uh, the, we have on this planet, uh, in this solar system, only one planet with liquid water, and that's us. So if you're uh, uh, going through the desert, you have a road map, and that says oasis, that's where you go. So we get a lot of visitations from various types of aliens, believe it or not, in various types of craft. And we have liquid water, so evidently they have some interest in water here, but not as a permanent base. I don't believe that. Okay, all right. Um, and then you also talked about uh, UFOs sort of uh, pulling the water up from from Earth, uh, you know, flying over a, pe a body of water and pulling it up. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard some, I've heard of stuff like that too. Uh, I don't know. Talk a little bit about that additional phenomenon. Okay, that's that's in my paper on my website called "Physical Influences of a UFO on Water." I mean, it's not the only influence that a UFO does to water. It creates bulges, depressions, which are called holes sometimes. Then mounding, and then finally the water spout. The water spout is because there's a suction under the UFO. And that's all regarding the field that rotates at a very high speed to protect the UFO. This whole suction thing is like a byproduct. It's like the, the prop wash. Uh, that's not necessarily for the flight of the aircraft. It's turbulent air in back of the aircraft. But it's, it's a function of the propeller doing it. Well, this is a function of the field doing it and it creates a suction underneath, and that suction sucks up cars, not, not cars all the way up, but it'll suck it off the road enough so you, your brakes don't apply, and uh, it sucks up water. So it's a byproduct. That's strictly all, that, that's all it is, is a byproduct. So it's not a situation like where they're taking the water to use or, or anything like that? They do use water, but they, they come along, they ask for a bucket of water, a cup of water, they, 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 they have hoses, pipes, and they suck it in that way. So it, it kind of emphasizes the fact that if they have an, a, an alternate means, why bother sucking it up, you know? That's, that's a byproduct, like I say. The, if they're taking water into the craft, they're doing it with a purpose. And that's what they're doing with the buckets, the tubes, and hoses, and so forth. They're sucking that into the craft. But this other suction that's below the UFO, like I say, it's a byproduct. They don't need to suck it that way. And it's not going into the craft. It's just uh, becoming more molecular as you go up and just bouncing at the bottom of the craft. It gives the impression that they're sucking up water. And what is this? Now you're saying they, they ask for water, uh, and you sh shared some interesting stories about that uh, last night. Talk a little bit about that, because these are stuff that I've never heard of before. Okay, well, uh, in most cases, they don't ask. Uh, they okay. usually, if, I mean, if there's no one around, they'll just take it, you know. Yeah. But by the same token, if there's somebody there at a place where they want to get the water from for some reason or other, uh, they will ask, you know, politely if they can get the water, you know, from that place. And um, most of the people are kind of stunned, you know, and it's a strange person here, and, you know, it's kind of humanoid. And um, they'll, they'll say, yeah, fine, take the water, you know, and it's kind of staring at this guy. He gets in the craft, and zing, he's gone, you know. As far as the USO stories that you've gotten and the cases and stuff like that, um, Obviously, it's hard to sort of put a percentage on that kind of thing, but are they primarily civilian type things? Do you get a lot of military cases where there's USOs reported? It's kind of 50-50. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to put a percentage on it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are doing uh, uh, mining or something like that, and the UFO pops down near a river that, that they're at. Uh, military, it's usually a ship at sea, of course, and uh, next thing you know, they're circling the ship. Uh, not necessarily doing anything with the ship. Uh, there have been you know, where um, the electronic system on the ship is knocked out while the UFO is in its uh, vicinity. As minute, as minute the UFO leaves, then everything pops back to normal again. So somehow the field or whatever it is within the craft is knocking out the, control, uh, the, the means of generating or uh, producing the electricity necessary. Um, uh, my website has uh, aircraft carriers, other large ships, and UFOs as a thing, and that's strictly military there. And uh, there are other cases of smaller UFO ships throughout my, all my texts. Mm -hmm. So uh, it does cover all bases. And uh, I just wanted to put the aircraft carriers in a different perspective because aircraft carriers 
are kind of like the, the mother ships. We call them mother ships. Yeah. They're actually the space carriers instead of aircraft carriers. They carry their own, um, uh, what you might call, uh, scout ships, uh, usually anywhere 10 to 15, no, 10 to, to uh, 30 feet in, in diameter. And uh, they come out of the mother ship and return to the mother ship again. So it's just like an aircraft carrier at sea that has airplanes coming off the decks and then returning to the craft again. So there's kind of a similarity there in mental uh, uh, thoughts about what you know a carrier is and what a space carrier is. And now we all know about uh, how the UFO phenomenon seems to obviously it's got quite a history. It goes all the way back you know to ancient times. Is it safe to assume that that is the case with the USO phenomenon? Oh yes, yes. My my cases start at the year 1067. Wow. So that's back a few years. Um, uh, there's been quite a few uh, cases in the 17, 1800s, which is closer to our era, you know, uh, and uh, some that were misidentified too, because the Indian Ocean has a, a lot of cases where they see spinning lights on the water's surface. But I don't believe that is a UFO. I believe that's what's uh, a seismic uh, thing. Of course, the Indian Ocean is highly, highly seismic. Uh, earthquakes, yeah. tsunamis, you name it. And so these things, only 99.9% .9 of these things are seen in the Indian Ocean only. Mm -hmm. So UFOs, though, USOs, if you will, are seen all over the world. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you can't pin it down and say it's only coming from one spot. You can pin down these, these pinwheels that are on the surface of the water, water wheels, into one area. So it doesn't follow the USO procedure thing. And it's safe to assume then uh, that the USOs, these aren't limited to oceans and seas. Uh, do you get a lot of lake USO stories, uh, reservoir maybe USO stories, or river type stories? All of the above. All of the above. Ponds. Oh, wow. Um, most of these craft are no more than, uh, like it's an 8 to 1 ratio, 8 feet w uh, wide and 1 foot high. And so a lot of them are, are in the uh, maximum 10 feet high. So all you need is 10 feet of water to hide it. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and that's the case. A lot of them come into the shore, and they, uh, people say there was a submarine out there. The Navy will deny it. They said, there's no way a submarine yeah. will get into 10 feet of water. Yeah. So, and they said, what the hell was it that, that can fly, you know, out of the surface? And USO. There you go. There you go. Uh, where can people find out more information about your stuff? And do you have any uh, books or anything like that coming up or already out? Tell people where they can find out more about Carl Feind. Okay, well, I'm thinking about a book. I'm going to start it in January, I believe. But uh, as far as immediately, my website, which you can put in Google as just water, UFO, no spaces, and I come up right at the top because it's a dedicated name site. And from there, all you got to do is scroll down once you've entered the website, and it has uh, either the cases uh, right at the top, list of sightings, or you can go down further, and there's a two-column thing with very specific areas about UFOs. Awesome, awesome. Carl, thank you so much for taking some time here during the weekend to talk to us. Really appreciate it. Definitely check out his website. It's got a ton of information. I'm going to get home. I'm going to do a thorough look at it. Hopefully we can bring you back for a full-length interview type situation where we'll be in the comfort of our own homes on the phone, that kind of thing. So thanks. Thanks a lot for taking some time to talk to me. My pleasure. Thank you. There you go. That was Carl Feint. Big thanks to him for taking some time over the course of the weekend to talk to us. Of course, you can find out more information on Carl at the website, www.waterufo.net. Pretty simple there, waterufo.net, all one word. Check it out. Following Carl here, we have the very esteemed Don Ledger to talk about the Black Triangle phenomenon, Shag Harbor, and his work researching pilot reports of UFOs. Let's take it away with Don Ledger direct from the Mass UFO Show. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash, and I have pulled aside Don Ledger. He is a major player in the world of ufology. He's done a ton of great work, and uh, we're going we're gonna to sit down and talk a little bit here at the conference about what he's here for and, and some of his great research. So, Don, uh, thank you very much for, for joining me here. Pleasure to be here, Tim. Uh, for starters, just tell people what you're presenting on here. You were you were talking about the Black Triangles. Uh, flesh that out a little bit. Tell us about uh, your presentation some and uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, over the last uh, maybe four or five years, I've taken an interest in the in the BTS, uh, where I'm a pilot myself at uh, 
predominantly because it sort of uh, bothers me the way these things to be, seem to be able to impinge on uh, on uh, air traffic controls, airspace, uh, and, the, and the airways in general. This can be a, a danger to flight. So I started looking into particularly the larger reports because they're kind of hard to to misinterpret. Uh, some people might see a few lights in the sky in a triangular shape that could be possibly an airplane, you know, but usually there's a noise associated with that. Uh, but in this, <clears throat> but usually the larger ones, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to mistake those. They're, they're, they're right in your face. They're up there. They're not very high. They're very, very big. So um, those in particular really interested me. So that's pretty much where I targeted. Uh, those are the ones I targeted uh, pretty much uh, most of the time. Talk a little bit about the sort of debate within the UFO world and outside the UFO world over the black triangles, UFO craft versus government uh, secret project. Uh, where do you fall on that, and what, what have you come to understand based on your research? Um, yeah, this is um, – for that issue, regarding that issue, I'm, uh, I can't buy into the government military or, or the military or government uh, uh, manufactured monstrous triangle. I've done a lot of research in this area. I also have a, a lot of uh, aviation material that comes into me as a, as a pilot. I'm also a, a writer in aviation, have been for some years now. And uh, so I know pretty much what the government is doing, in, particularly in the United States, and that's what we're talking about. I might be a Canadian, but I, I predominantly research in the, in the American side. We know the Soviet Union isn't a player anymore in this regard. They just don't have the money. And... Um, Nobody in the European market. Uh, the Chinese aren't that far uh, that far along yet, so that really just leaves the United States. So um, um, I know it's been suggested many times, and this same um, explanation has been popping up ever since uh, 1947, after Ken Arnold. Uh, it's some kind of a secret military aircraft been being developed by the government. The thing is, is they never ever come to fruition. Those secret military aircraft of 60 years ago, should, we should know about them by now. Why, are, why would the, uh, the American government, uh, government and the Air Force be spending billions and billions of dollars developing new weapons if they already have something that's so great that nobody can touch it? Um, and that, as far as I'm concerned, that, uh, that, that applies as well to the, the big black triangles. Uh, these things, um, whatever's keeping them in the sky, I don't know. Monstrous. They're quite often they're reported as being the size of a football field or two football fields. One I talked about uh, last night in my presentation was uh, estimated at about 3,600 feet on one side. So that's a monster. Um, in his book, Tim Good uh, refers to an object sighted by Lancaster pilots during the Second World War, of uh, which they estimated to be over a mile long. Uh, when they saw it in the sky, they didn't even try to fire on it. It was at night. They, none of them believed that this was uh, some kind of a German military craft. Now, we're going back into 1943 and 44 here. And, um, but, so there you are. We have these monsters back then. They didn't say this was a triangle, but they couldn't, to be honest, they couldn't say what it was. All it was was a string of lights about over a mile long, right beside their aircraft, and it, it just awed them. They didn't try to shoot at it. Uh, there's a, more to that story in his, in his book, but... Um, so that carries on through today. We get these large monstrous triangles right up through into the Hudson Valley sightings. Here we have huge, some kind of huge, uh, some kind of huge craft over modern suburbia, uh, over neighborhoods, 50 to 500, 500 feet in altitude above the ground, in in one of the biggest trackons in the world, the New York trackon, the New York uh, Terminal Radar Control Area. Um, and uh, tracking radar control area, and um, which is highly illegal. Yeah. And you're just not allowed to fly in an area uh, like this without being in contact with tower or air traffic control. Everybody has to be. Uh, a lot of people miss, miss this point, uh, but pilots don't because they know how, uh, how, uh, how illegal this can be, you know, just how much you're, you can get your butt kicked for doing something uh, in this regard, flying, you know, ultralights at night and so on and so forth. You know, there's a lot of nonsense. That was one of the explanations somebody came up with. This was an ultralight, for instance, in uh, the Hudson Valley sighting. There was a bunch of ultralights that decided to go up that night and fly in formation. That's ridiculous. It's absurd is what it is. Not only because 
these it's a uh, it's crazy to fly ultralights at night normally because they don't usually these uh, air, the, the ultralights don't have any uh, particularly back in 1982 they were very basic in those days they don't have the kind of instrumentation aboard um, the electronics aboard uh, uh, basically they're uh, back then they were just barely flying they could only they could only fly in like five to eight knot winds and once the winds came up they had that was it you were grounded because you might, you might not get back on the ground or you could fold a wing up or so on. They're a little stronger, some of the newer ones nowadays. But anyway, in this particular instance, you had these monstrous things flying in, uh, in the northern sector of, uh, of New York's uh, terminal radar control area and um, with impunity. Yet these are supposed to be top-secret aircraft developed by the military, yet they seem to want to test them out over, you know, millions of people. Yeah. who can see them in the sky. I mean, and there are millions of people living in that area. Uh, that, to me, again, is absurd. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, you mentioned earlier when we were talking off, off uh, outside the studio about um, the fact that uh, NIDS had published a report on this. And this was conjecture on their part. I actually have a, uh, a picture of a, a conceptual uh, a picture of what they thought it might look like. Uh, and... Um, Again, this tried to attribute it to some experimental aircraft that the uh, United States uh, government was, or the uh, Air Force was, uh, was building for whatever purpose. Um, now, in reality, what they're building are blimp-shaped objects, or not objects even, blimp-shaped aircraft, which are in development stage, which are no more, really, not much more sophisticated than what was being flown, there were blimps during the Second World War by the Navy, the German, uh, uh, you know, uh, rigid dirigibles, um, you know, like the, the Hindenburg and so on. And uh, these things were quite huge. I mean, uh, the Hindenburg was over 800 feet long, and that was impressive. Um, but still, in all, there was a, a whole uh, there's a, there's a whole class of aerodynamics that goes along with with these things. They have to be able to push themselves through the air. That means they have to have engines powerful enough to shove them through the air. Uh, blimps and uh, dirigibles suffered from what's called a inverse drag, which means the larger they got, the more drag they, permit, they presented to the air, uh, air as they're trying to push their way through them, and um, through the air. And uh, so that meant more power. More power means more weight, more fuel. It, it was a self-defeating purpose. And... Um, so they could only basically get these things up to around 90 to 100 knots. So even now, what the, government, what the uh, United States uh, Air Force is experimenting with, and Lockheed uh, Martin has been uh, developing, I showed some pictures last night, last year they had a test flight on one. It was only about 200 feet long, but it looked like three Goodyear blimps stuck together side by side. And um, they're using, and this one in particular right now, can't, uh, it can't fly in, in anything over 10 knots. They have to land because it's just they're hoping to get it up to about 120 mile an hour type of an aircraft, which is going to be used as some kind of a platform for surveillance and for, um, well, basically surveillance, uh, almost like AWACS. Yeah. Um, maybe surreptitious at night being able to fly into an area nice and quiet, you know, with the low speed propellers turning around. But uh, essentially what they're shooting for is to, uh, some kind of a craft that they can get up at 100,000 feet and just hang there. And they're over the horizon, and they're over probably even out past the border with the country that they're, uh, they're fighting with at the time. And uh, so they're out of, out of range, they're out of rocket range. As you know, no country's going to fire into another country's territory if they, can, if they can help it. They're out of range, they're up there. They don't have to worry about the satellite's problem of uh, coming down in a polar orbit, crossing over an area and only having five to seven, eight minutes of time to uh, actually do any serious photographing. And then... Um, before they, uh, uh, before they, uh, their elevation and angle gets as such that they can't uh, uh, get good video anymore. So these things can stay in the same place for months. You know, this is what they hope to do. Uh, they haven't got this yet, uh, but they're working on it. But here now they're spending millions and millions of dollars just to accomplish this fact. So they're trying to develop these things, uh, you know, for maybe uh, operations, you know, at 60, 80, 100,000 feet. But there's spending millions of dollars on this now. Uh, I know Lockheed Martin is doing it on their own. They don't have a contract from the government, but they're uh, getting started now and uh, have spent uh, all of this money uh, just in developmental research. And um, my question is, uh, 
if they're going to do that, um, why reinvent the wheel if they already have uh, aircraft that are capable of doing that now and way much and, and way better than uh, than uh, what these craft are capable of doing that they're developing right now, which are basically still blimps or balloons, really. So it just seems to me that it's it's not it doesn't make any sense to me that the U.S. government or the Air Force would put out all this budgetary all of this funding, millions and millions of dollars, and the one the one I was telling you about that should hover at around 100,000 feet, they're they're prepared to invest 800 million dollars in this thing, oh, wow. and that's a lot of money to invest in something. Uh, if you already have something that's much better than that, yeah. much technically uh, superior, and uh, you all have it already. What's the point of hiding these things if they're not going to use them, you know? Uh, NIDS made a, a, a good stab at it by uh, bringing up certain uh, type of uh, uh, engines that can be used now, and uh, but they didn't really get much into the structure of these things, and they were talking about a smaller aircraft than people are normally reported. I report, uh, part of my talk last night was an incident in Cow Bay. I, oh, I just mentioned that earlier, about being 3,600 feet on a side. Yeah. Uh, now we're talking about 36 feet on, on a 3,600 feet on a side, but how thick through was, would something like that have to be to maintain its structure? And I, uh, you know, I did some rough math on this and checked around with a few engineers, but they figured if you're going to have something 3,600 feet on a side to support it, if there's some kind of structure inside, you're probably looking at something in the neighborhood of three to 400 feet thick through. That's just wow. from the bottom to the top. This is a monster machine. And um, now you need the fuel, to run, the, the fuel, well, the, the the engines to run something like this to push it through the sky. Um, the uh, and of course the fuel, the personnel to run it, and so on and so forth, and whatever its job is, so you're going to have all of that on board. Plus the infrastructure, the the structure inside the aircraft that just keeps this thing together and keeps it rigid enough to keep it in the sky. You're not unless things, this thing is a series of blimps. 3,600 feet long, which seems to me to be, uh, again, a little bit ridiculous. It just doesn't work for me because you're, you're, this is a pretty flimsy rig at this point. And then it seems like this black triangle thing sort of just kind of came about in the last 20 years or so, but I'm sure that you would have more information about that. What's the chronology of the black triangle sightings, and do you think they sort of uh, just sort of came along recently, or is that something that we can trace back further? There are black triangle sightings going back into the uh, 50, late 50s and early 60s, I have a couple myself, even from my area up in Nova Scotia. One over the Minus Basin in 1972, I believe. And um, and there are other uh, reports from, you know, the United States and England and so forth of black triangular-shaped aircraft. So I believe they've been along a lot longer than this. Uh, Hudson Valley certainly brought focus uh, to this particular type of UFO. Uh, again, you know, there, there seem to be as many shapes in UFOs as there are automobiles in the world in different shapes and makes and sizes. I don't know if that's the reason why that happens. But um, the um, there are, uh, I have one in my uh, booklet inside there that's, I believe, 1906 where a farmer reported, it's either 1905 or 1906 in the United States, reported a black triangular, a triangle, black triangular shaped object crossing over his field during the day. Now, 1906, you know, or 1905, is um, you can't explain that. You know, there's we just didn't have we didn't have any airplanes that flew like that. And uh, 1903, the bar you know the Wright brothers barely got off the ground in 1903, and it was like 1906, 1907, 1908 before a Blériot in France could even make it across the Channel um, in that aircraft of his, and uh, before any aircraft were strong enough to really fly much more than about 10 miles. So I don't know what this thing was uh, back in 1905 or 6, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was uh, something of the UFO ilk just back in that day. I think they brought it around for quite a while. We've talked with Chris Stiles. We've had him on the show. He was on the show uh, last spring, and, and, of course, you're very well aware of the Shag Harbor incident. You helped him out. You co-wrote the book with him. I'm sure you did a ton of research. Talk a little bit about the Shag Harbor incident, your take on it, and all that good stuff. Well... The Shag Harbor incident, uh, Chris Dahls, as you said, has already been on the show talking about it. Um, it's, a, it's a tough story to tell in a very, sh in a very few minutes, as Chris will tell you. There's yeah. so many avenues and little trails that run off to the side and interesting little uh, events that happen. Uh, essentially, you know, a, a fisherman and uh, three friends driving along in a car see something coming down out of the sky at an angle uh, on October the 4th, uh, 
1967, around 20 after, 25 after 11 in the evening, and um, lose sight of it after uh, uh, after it goes down behind the trees, but just shortly after they come around from behind the trees, get close to the shoreline, get out of the car and look out and see something drifting on the water with a pale yellow light on the top of it. So they're concerned. Uh, their take on it is that they just saw an airplane crash, and they think, you know, maybe this is a piece of it with still one of the navigation lights. Uh, they don't carry pale yellow lights on airplanes to begin with, but uh, they didn't know that. So uh, Lori Wickens, who was the uh, primary, and this guy really started the whole thing off. Without Lori Wickens making that phone call, we probably would never have been involved. There probably never would have been a Shea Harbor incident. So anyway, he runs down the road with his friends in the car. They make a pay, pay phone call to the RCMP, and... Uh, uh, in a detachment, that's what they call their offices, uh, detachment back in Barrington Passage. He reports it. Uh, where Bicky, who takes the call, he's a corporal, asks him if he's been drinking because he knows Lori yeah. Wickens. Lori's only 17 then, but he's a proficient, he's a, a fisherman now, a full-time fisherman on somebody else's boat. And um, uh, so in the meantime, uh, I guess his phone rang, as according to Ron, Ron O'Brien, uh, told me that when he was talking to Rebecca about it, Rebecca said his phone started to ring, another phone started to ring. So he asked uh, uh, Lori to um, hang up. Well, at first he asked for the phone number at the pay phone, and he told him to hang up and stay put. And he went over and answered the phone, and there was uh, several other people over a period of about five minutes had called in from different points around Shag Harbor, uh, as, some as far away as 13 miles, saying, they thought they saw something crashing in the, in the area around Shag Harbor. It looked like an airplane coming down. So he's taking it serious at this point. Calls in the uh, two other mounties. He's got staked out on a clearing somewhere down in Lower Woods Harbor, or Upper Woods Harbor, I think it was. Uh, they were looking for deer jackers, which is deer poachers, I think they call them down here. Um, and uh, so he calls them back to the office. They, uh, he tells them what's happening, thinks he's got a crashed airplane. They go roaring back down to a place called the uh, what was then the Irish Moss Plant. And... Um, uh, is now still there. It looks pretty much the same as it did, different paint job on it, but uh, no longer a, an Irish moss plant. It's a, uh, an underwater uh, film crew uses the place to store and do some background. And uh, But anyway, um, the um, so they're watching this thing out on the water. The thing is uh, drifting, it seems, with the tide, or maybe it's under its own power. They're not sure. The, the tide is at an ebb at that point. And um, so... Uh, after a while, they, uh, they first of all, they, just, they they think maybe they should try and take a dory out that's tied up close to the Irish moss plant. And then they think maybe that's a little too dangerous. You must remember the night is clear, no clouds, lots of stars, bright, bright starry sky, but no moon, and um, uh, hardly any wind. But they still think that dory might be a little too, which is sort of a fisherman's rowboat, a little too dangerous to take out and try to get three or four people in it. Besides, if they tried to cover, recover somebody over the side, you could, you know, tip the boat over. So um, Rebecca uh, has the other two Mounties, which is Ron O'Brien and Ron Pond. Ron Pond is the rookie at the time, so he's given a notebook. Well, he gets his notebook out, and he's told to go around and take, uh, do interviews with the witnesses. Uh, he tells Ron, Ron O'Brien, the other uh, Mountie there, to go find a, a house, wake people up if he has to, make a phone call into the rescue coordination center in Halifax. Don't forget the 67. They don't have the communication systems we have nowadays. Yeah. In the meantime, where Bicky himself goes to another house, wakes up uh, some people there, gets use of their phone, calls a couple of local fishermen he knows, which is uh, Lawrence Smith and uh, Bradford Shand, gets asked them if they, if they would take their boat out to, to go out uh, on the sound uh, with some uh, searchers because they think they have a downed aircraft. This whole thing takes place. Yeah. Before they actually leave, they lose sight of the uh, pale yellow light in the water. They think it might have sunk. So it's getting even more urgent as we go. Make a long story short, they get into these fishing boats, uh, several, uh, you know, quite a few of them actually. So they, uh, they start steaming across this uh, channel, that's uh, uh, the sound they call it, um, which is about two, maybe two miles wide at one point, you know, narrows down a bit to about... Uh, uh, maybe a mile and three-quarter, mile and a half, uh, and about five miles long, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, bordered by Odor Island and the, and, the sh and the shoreline. So they steam across this heading for uh, uh, what's called the budget light, and um, it's a buoy. And um, to um, 
they uses that as a line. Lauren Smith told me this. He said, I just sort of bore down in the budget light so that I was going across. If, I, if, if anything was along there, I, maybe I'd find it. Use that as a navigation point because it's nighttime. So anyway, uh, rather than seeing any bodies in the water, the first thing they run across is this big swath on the water, which uh, is, looks like foam. Now, they, all the fishermen have said and testified to this fact that this wasn't sea foam. They all know what sea foam looks like. They were fishermen after all, seen it all their lives. Uh, they equated it more with uh, sort of like a thick shaving cream, maybe three to four inches thick, with a sprinkly uh, yellow, like uh, yellow glistening uh, speckles all over the top of it. And it had some, some of them thought they smelled a, an odor of sulfur. There was some uh, bubbling in the water, perhaps, and maybe this stuff coming up out of the water. Uh, they assumed it was, they uh, figured it to be at least 80 feet wide because the boats in the day were about 40 feet long and it would take two boat lengths to get through it. And they estimated it about a half a mile long. Their thinking at the time, I don't remember when I interviewed Lawrence Smith, he said, well, you know, I thought at the time maybe this was some kind of byproduct of the aircraft. Maybe jet fuel in mixing with seawater would cause this, yeah. some kind of foam. He'd heard about foaming and so on. Uh, mixing that up with foaming down runways, you know, when a jet's crashing or, or foaming the aircraft itself down to prevent fire. But anyway, um, so they didn't know what it was. They weren't fussy about sailing into it, but they didn't have much choice if they were looking for survivors. Yeah. Uh, some of the fishermen had knots in their stomachs because they were, you know, uh, particularly uh, Normie Smith and Laurie and so on, because they're figuring they're going to find, they don't know what they're going to find in the water, but yeah. they figure it's going to be gory. And, um, but they don't find anything. They don't find any bodies floating, parts of bodies flowing, no, no survivors. They don't find any airplane or anything. They're searching for an hour and a half, about probably an hour and 20 minutes into the search. The uh, Coast Guard cutter shows up from Cape Sable Island from Clarks Harbor, steams on over, has a message for Ron Pond aboard saying that RCC has responded. And they've been doing a search for, uh, you know, that long at least uh, since he called them trying to find out if any aircraft were missing up and down the coast. And that includes the United States. They're looking for Air, Fast, Air, uh, sorry, Air Force and, uh, and uh, private aircraft and commercial aircraft. Nobody was missing. Nothing was missing. Nobody could find any, anything missing. So I guess the fishermen at that time were probably wondering what the heck we're looking for. Well, by that time, the uh, air desk in Ottawa uh, with the uh, Squadron leader uh, William Bain, who was manning the air desk at the time, which was Canada's UFO reporting center, the RCAF's air for was the Air Force in the day, and uh, he uh, didn't take very long, uh, probably about four or five o'clock in the morning, before he'd already classed this thing as a UFO and underlined it three times on the documents. You know, there's so much more. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Yeah, yeah. Now you were saying before we started taping that uh, that your primary interest is UFO, uh, I presume, uh, pilot reports of UFOs, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, just talk a little bit about your research in that realm and how long you've been doing that and what you've found out and all that good stuff. You're probably aware of uh, um, the Nav National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena, uh, run by Dr. Richard Haynes out in uh, Washington State. Mm -hmm. And um, he's uh, retired from NASA. He's a scientist there. He's chief scientist with them. And um, he started uh, this organization to uh, investigate pilot sightings exclusively and uh, pilot reports, air traffic controller reports. At that time, I'd already been doing that myself on my own here in Can up in Canada, and, um, but I became affiliated with them as what's called a technical specialist for uh, NARCAP, in, but in Canada. And I've been involved in a couple of papers, the O'Hare sighting and so on. Uh, I was involved in that latest report they had. But on my own, I'd been uh, picking up the odd report over the years from pilots or, you know, secondary reports, some that had been around for years, People would mail them to me, you know, because they knew of my interests. Anyway, I've had several, uh, maybe a dozen really interesting reports of my own, you know, things that just can't be sloughed off as uh, conventional sighting of other aircraft. I'm sure most cases pilots aren't going to do that anyway. Air, you know, uh, space junk, you know, boosters, meteors, satellites, and so on and so forth. Some are pretty scary. And what really concerns pilots is when these things get in close proximity to them and they don't know what its intentions are. Because they're locked into an airway, particularly airlines. They're not allowed to deviate from it, not from altitude or course. And um, if they do, they have to answer for it to air traffic control because they're going to know right off the bat when they do. And if they have to do it because of some object that's all of a sudden coming close to their airplane and making them very nervous uh, because, they, again, they don't know what their intentions are, then they have to answer for it. And that can be, turn into a bit of a conundrum for a pilot. A lot of pilots don't like to report these things. 
uh, particularly airline pilots, because it might affect their uh, careers. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there's the peer pressure, uh, you know, getting ridiculed by your buddies or just being ribbed about it. But you know that underlying uncomfortable feeling that you know they think you're a little bit weird, you know, and they don't want that. And I'm sure military pilots don't want to do it, but I'm sure uh, on the military side they might even have orders in these things. I know the service reports for years, which is uh, airline port reporting, was a direct result of the Cold War, but they were also looking for UFO reports as well. So you did report them, and nobody was going to laugh at you. But that's a long story because there's a, there's a lot of uh, detail to go into on service reportings and so on. And, uh, but uh, anyway, so that's one of my interests now, and I spend a lot of time on that. I guarantee pilots anonymity, you know, uh, I've signed it a case file study and uh, just a number. If I talk about it, it's just a case file study and, uh, uh, study and a number. And it pretty much stands that way now. Where can people find out more information on you? got a website and stuff like that, and, and any of the books that people can pick up that you got and all that yeah. good stuff. Tell people where they can find out more information on and from Don Ledger. Okay. Well, I've written uh, three books about UFOs, or two books about UFOs. One was Maritime UFO Files years ago. It's now out of print. And, of course, Dark Object with Chris Stiles. The middle book was Swiss Air Down about the crash of Swiss Air Flight 111 off Nova Scotia. Nothing to do with UFOs. Um, I write magazine articles for aviation and trade papers and so on. I also write other magazine articles, you know, about UFOs yeah. for various magazines. But um, uh, direct contact, they can contact me through my website at donledger.com. Now, if they go on there now, they'll find, uh, they might be surprised to find there's a writer's workshop being advertised in, uh, on, the, on the website. Um, I haven't had a chance to take that down in the last two weeks since the workshop just got over about a week and a half ago. Oh, okay. And uh, so if they go to the at the very top of the page, they'll notice where I mentioned that I'm a pilot. And right after that, there's a, a little blue, uh, probably 10-point uh, UAP in brackets, the, the letters UAP. If they click on that, that'll take you right through to my UFO stuff. And some of it's pretty old now. I'm in the process of changing that around because I've changed my, my web host. I couldn't do anything before because I had a small web host and not like five megs of space and that. You can't do much with five megs anymore. But anyway, that's where they can find me. They'll find my email address and everything on there. Awesome, awesome. Don, thank you so much. This has been a crazy one here. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tim. There you go. Big thanks to Don Ledger for taking quite a bit of time out of the weekend to talk to us at the conference. You can find more on Don Ledger at the website, www.donledger.com. D-O-N-L-E-D-G-E-R.com. Check it out. Up next, wrapping up the on-site interviews, we're talking with former BOA Audio guest Chris Stiles. We're going to be finding out about what he's been up to since his BOA Audio appearance, how he feels about being known as the Shag Harbor guy, and some interesting information on his other work involving reality transformation and controlled witness perception studies. Without any further ado, here's Chris Stiles making his BOA Audio return at the Mass UFO Show. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash, and I'm here with former Been All of America audio guest Chris Stiles. You probably heard him last spring. If you haven't heard him, check it out. We did an amazing in-depth discussion on the Shag Harbor incident. Um, I'm sure, of course, that's what he's talking about, so just tell people what you're here talking about and give them a little thumbnail on that. Well, I came down here as part of the continuing 40th uh, anniversary celebrations about the case, and I'm hoping here that for the first time here in Massachusetts to give the people just a good overview of this enduring mystery. And do you find there's a lot of interest here in America? I'm sure it's popular up in Canada. Um, but what's the take down, down here in America as far as the Shag Harbor incident? It's sort of uh, uh, shattered, I guess, by the Roswell story, of course, but it seems like now it's starting to gain a little popularity as well. Yeah, and I, I've been very pleasantly surprised, Tim, because what I find is down here is that the case is um, differentiated enough from Roswell. There's been enough U.S. segmented and feature treatments. They seem to have grasped it, both in its similarities and mostly in its differences from Roswell. The other thing is people here seem to be sophisticated enough to realize that UFO phenomena is worldwide. They don't look at it from the borders. They want to know as much about this story as the next one, in some ways even more so because it's new to them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, I sort of presented this question to uh, Stan Friedman before because he's pigeonholed as the Roswell guy. And, of course, you are all over the place presenting about Shag Harbor, and you, you're really sort of the authority on Shag Harbor. Just, I guess, describe that role, and if you find it, I'm sure you don't find it burdensome because I know that, that it was your own personal love and interest in the case that sort of drove your own research. But uh, I guess just talk about being 
being sort of typecast like that, and you know the pluses and minuses of that whole thing of being associated with one specific popular case. Well, it's a burden I'm prepared to accept, Tim. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the thing is, Shag Harbor incident is the gift that keeps on giving ufologically. It's still an act of ongoing investigation. The heady early days of gobs of documents coming, fresh witnesses, but it still happens. I recently found two new witnesses that were on the Coast Guard boat. Um, shortly before coming down here, we had a nice little surprise. The Coast Guard uh, sent a gentleman down to Shag Harbor, went into the post office here, and turned over the actual ship's logbook, which had been lost for years, as an artifact for the Shag Harbor uh, Incident UFO Society to hang on to. So, you know, things are ongoing, and I do do other things, and sometimes we get into that. You know, once, to put that in perspective, and you'll like this, a couple of years back at one of the MUFON symposiums, Don Ledger and myself were down there as presenters, and neither one of us talked about Shag Harbor. Don talked about black triangles, and I presented on reality transformation. So there's life after Shag. There you go. What's, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this reality transformation. What do you mean by that? Because I didn't even know anything about this. So, Well, on Paul's website, mm -hmm. Paul Kimball, who has the excellent uh, the other side of truth, right? You should look at the work in the, the section he's got on what I did on the Lower Sackville case in Nova Scotia, and it's typical of the kind of reality transform transformation cases I seek out. And this is in the sense of Jacques Vallée's work on, on that kind of thing. And I define reality transformation simply as cases that exhibit controlled witness perception. Controlled witness perception. Uh, flesh that out a little bit. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Typically, you would have the kind of scenario where two people stand in the same spot and observe the same UFO event and have entirely different interpretations of what just happened. And there's no physical, logical explanation for it. I consider this a marker of reality transformation and, in fact, um, a proof that there is such a thing as RT. And what do you make of that sort of thing when you have two people and they see something and they have different interpretations of it? Well, what's your interpretation as the outsider looking at that situation uh, now, I understand reality transformation, but I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Uh, what do you make of that? What, that whatever they're seeing is interacting with them specifically and shaping what they see, or, or what? You know, educate me a little. <laughs> well, I think there, there's a number of combinations, and what it is is you, 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 there may be a core physical real event, or there may not. And, but even when there is... Um, when you attempt to control witness perception, it's not always successful. People react differently. We're all individuals, just as if we took a drug or whatever. What ultimately the purpose is, other than a screen memory or whatever, I'm not sure. And, you know, when people discuss alien purposes, if there are aliens, I don't know their purpose. Yeah. But um, what I'm saying is I've simply proved through police reports and other things and follow-up investigation. And, and believe me, Paul Kimball's website, The Other Side of Truth, on my work on the Lower Sackville case, exemplifies what I mean. He thought it was significant, and I have to agree, and I think it points out it's something that's been largely ignored in North America, the RT and the European view. Uh, I believe there's a physical reality to the UFO phenomena, but there's also a strong psychic component, and I think this is the mechanism of that component. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, and now, obviously, there's always going to be comparisons between Roswell and Shag Harbor, crashes, famous crashes, all that. And uh, like we were talking off, off air or whatever, about how you know the U.S. government every few years they every like seems like every anniversary or whatever of Roswell they try and say something about what it was and they try and change the story around a little bit. Um, and you were saying this, it's, that's a different situation up in Canada. They're kind of hands off on the whole thing. So since the Shag Harbor incident, has the Canadian government got involved in any way, or is it pretty much they don't want to deal with it anymore? Well, with government, as always, one hand doesn't know always what the other does, and I'm sure there are departments with, that would like to see it just go away. But I can say I've never felt the presence of the hand of government interfering. A cooperation with many departments, from RCMP to DND to National Archives, has been excellent. Um, had a few problems with the Coast Guard and other divisions. But, look, things aren't perfect. Overall, um, it's very different than the U.S. situation. Uh, currently, on the National Archives site, when you look on the Shag Harbor case, they have a nice little one-page thing with some attached documents that actually say the case was unsolved and, as far as RCMP were concerned, was far from conventional is the term they use. And at the end it says the case remains open and solved and the D&D believed it was a UFO. So, you know, National Archives has actually helped promote the case by disseminating this information. And like I say, so far, cooperation's been good. Look, there's things... I'm not saying there's no evasion and there's things get lost, but for the most part, it's been quite good. 
And uh, what have you been up to? It's only been a brief period of time since you were on the show, six months or so. Uh, what have you been up to since then? I know you said you took a trip out to PEI to investigate the Ebenezer story. Um, I don't know. Give us a little update on what's going on with Chris Stiles in the past six months. Well, yes, I had a trip to Ebenezer. It was quite memorable and somewhat productive. It was the first time that, you know, we went out in the field just initially trying to relocate uh, interestingly enough, it's not, it reminds me of the early days of Shag Harbor. The community has forgotten this entirely. The actual eyewitnesses have moved to other locations. So it's very hard to track down the site, but we did that. Uh, had a, I was with a fellow UFO researcher from Ontario, David Savet, and it, was give it, it gave us a chance. It was actually just an excuse for us to meet, but as usual when I started digging, we hit pay dirt. And I hope in the future to be able to update you and give you something quite hot. Up to date, see, the only thing ever published on Ebenezer is in the, you know, the, the book of Chris Rakowski, uh, the Canadian UFO Report, which has a good overall treatment, but it's time to get beneath the surface of that one. I think in time, I'm not sure it's going to have the depth of Shag Harbor, but hopefully it's going to yield something more about the case and perhaps a little something about the phenomena. That's what I really look for. And you've, uh, now you've talked to people who had sightings or, or whatever uh, with the Ebenezer thing. Have you come up with much in the way of uh, like documentation from the government and that kind of thing? I know you had a huge mass of documents for Shag yeah. Harbor, What's the situation as far as documents go with the Ebenezer yeah. story? Well, we have a few already. We have certainly some from the Rescue Coordination Center that were preserved in National Archives. We're currently looking for the RCMP reports because they were involved that night. Um, RCC documents mention that at least a dozen local residents called the nearby detachment in Charlottetown and the two many's were unseen, and the one was a witness to it before it disappeared in the trees. So we're hoping to recover those reports that are currently uh, not currently they're sort of lost in National Archives, but I'm good at helping them find things. If necessary, down the road, I have a planned trip, hopefully next summer or the year after, to look for that, and a dozen other things are having trouble locating. Awesome, awesome. Um, what do you have coming up down the line? Anything you want to promote or anything like that, or a website, or how can people contact you, all that good stuff? I usually use Google. I don't have a <laughs> website. And it's a good buffer zone. And Look, I, I have a listed phone number. Anybody that's trying to reach me with information or help, you can send it to shagharbor at hotmail.com. And that's the usual Canadian spelling, all lowercase. And I look forward to your emails. And I will answer all. I'm sometimes away for up to four days at a time. But um, that works. You know, sometimes in Canada, you communicate whatever way you can. Phone, email, carrier pigeon, whatever <laughs> works. I get back to you. All right, awesome. Chris, thank you so much, not only for taking some time here with me today, but also for doing the great interview last spring. If you haven't heard the interview with Chris Stiles at banalofamerica.com, definitely check it out. We just we go through Shag Harbor from top to bottom. It's an intense interview, and it's in-depth and thorough and awesome. And that's all thanks to Chris. I just ask the questions. He's the one that provides the information. So, Chris, thanks for taking the time here this weekend to talk to me. Thanks, Tim, and I, I do thank you for your interest. Honestly, it's important. Sometimes that's all we got to go on is that people do appreciate the work. Thank you. That does it for the BOA Audio Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash special. Hopefully you enjoyed the theme episode. A thousand apologies for some of the interviews that may have sounded a little weird, but that's the kind of thing that happens when you're taping on location. I want to give big, big, huge thanks to the following folks. Lauren Coleman, Chris Balzano, Don Keating, Carl Feint, Don Ledger, and Chris Stiles. I also want to give big, big, super huge thanks to the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash organizer, John Horrigan. John welcomed me to the conference with open arms and pretty much gave me the run of the place. Got to do whatever I wanted, hung around in the green room, hung around backstage and hobnobbed with the speakers. It was a great time. So big, big thanks to John Horrigan, and I will be seeing you at the Mass UFO Show slash Mass Monster Mash 3 next October. Before we dive into the Ben All of America audio listener feedback mailbag, I want to give a little mention here that this podcast that you're listening to, a Ben All of America, is nominated for a 2007 Zorgi Award, which is the brainchild of former BOA audio guest Paul Kimball and his blog, The Other Side of Truth. Right now we're doing pretty well in the polling, but we could always use more votes. So if you're listening to this and you're a BOA audio enthusiast and you want to help us repeat as top paranormal podcast in the Zorgi Awards, go to banalofamerica.com. You'll see a plethora of Zorgi links. Check those out. Click on the links. Top podcast is the first award listed. Click on Banal of America. Vote for us. Help us stay on top 
of the 2007 Zorgi Awards. It would be hugely appreciated. Let's show the online esoteric world what the BOA Nation can do. Moving right along, it's time for the return of BOA Audio listener feedback. And the big return email comes from James in Washington. Here's what James has to say. Tim, firstly, congratulations on a great start to Season 3. Jim Mars always has something interesting to say, and Karen Dolan is truly a breath of fresh air. I feel optimistic about where ufology is going, with people like the Dolans, Mac Tonys, Nick Redfern, and yourself. I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. The merging of ufology, paranormal, cryptozoology, and just about everything else weird and unexplainable you can think of seems to be the best thing to happen in years, for all the genres and subgenres of esoterica. Yes, the future looks bright. Onward to the real issue. Tim, bring back the yeah yeahs. I miss him. We all do. I believe I understand your reasoning. Perhaps a few bad letters. Perhaps a need to appear more professional, etc. But the yeah yeahs have become, well, almost a trademark, emblematic of a new generation's dizzying enthusiasm for the topics at hand. Please kindly consider this request as purely constructive and to just give it some thought. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, James, in Washington. There you go. Thank you for writing in, James. Congratulations on being the debut letter for this season's BOA Audio Listener Feedback. It wouldn't be BOA Audio Listener Feedback if we didn't bring up the classic debate from Season 2, and that is, of course, the Yeah Yeahs. Last season, someone wrote in telling me to stop saying yeah, yeah when the guest was talking. I responded, of course, to explain why that sort of thing happens, and did my best to remove some of the yeahs in future interviews, until I got this email here from James regarding the yeah, yeahs. As such, I've gone out of my way to include a few yeahs here and there in the interviews that are coming up, and a few mmms, and also, of course, my trademark, wow, those will all be in future interviews, so don't worry, the yas and the wows aren't going anywhere. They're still going to be a part of the program. Although, I will say that I've noticed that I've cut back on saying yeah in general during the interviews, so there's nothing really to remove from the interviews because I just don't say it as much anymore. But maybe this letter will spurn me on to bring back the yas. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to kick off BOA Audio listener feedback than uh, the big yeah debate. Thank you, James, for the kudos and props on the beginning of Season 3. Stick around. It's only going to get better from here on out. We've got some tremendous interviews already taped that will be coming to your ears and computers in the not-too-distant future. If you want to be a part of BOA Audio listener feedback, go to binallofamerica.com. Click the Contact button on the left-hand side of the screen. That'll bring you to the BOA Contact page. Or... Even easier, just send your emails to boaaudio at hotmail.com, boaaudio at hotmail.com. Either one of those methods puts your correspondence on the road to BOA Audio listener feedback. Up next, it is the credits portion of the program. Big, big thanks to the fantastic banalofamerica.com staff. Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., and Tina Senna for your help and support with the audio series and the website. Tons of stuff going on over at BOA this past week. Both R. Lee and Leslie had takes on this growing disclosure movement in the past couple weeks in the world of ufology. Leslie has some in-depth coverage of the CNN Larry King episode that covered the UFO witnesses, and Regan had her take on all of the crazy events in the last couple weeks with regards to UFO disclosure, press conferences, and media coverage. Later on in the week, Chiron covered the 9-11 Truth Movement and what seems to have become the latest trend in that movement, and that is the public disruption methodology that seems to have swept the 9-11 Truth Movement. Chiron has his take on what that's all about and what it might mean long-term for the 9-11 Truth Movement. So as you can see, there is top-notch reading material, opinion columns, and coverage of the world of esoterica at large via the fantastic BOA writing staff. Leslie, Chiron, Arlie, Jovi, and Tina Senna. As we say week in and week out here on the program, if you're only listening to BOA Audio and you're not reading the columns at the website, you're only getting half the story. 
If you are a long-time BOA audio listener or an appreciative newcomer and you want to help support the audio series and the website, there's a way you can do that. You go to banalofamerica.com, click the PayPal button, and you make a donation. No donation is too small, and all donations go towards keeping the website and the podcast up and running, freely available, and ad-free for all of our great listeners the world over. Now, we've been teasing all new merchandise from banalofamerica.com. The BOA line, I am happy to report, will be unveiled at BOA this coming Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, known by those in the know as Black Friday. We have put a ton of effort into these designs. I will discuss them more in depth next week after they've been unveiled. But suffice it to say, I feel that they capture the message of the BOA Audio listeners, what they want to convey to people out there in the real world. It's not standard BOA merchandise. It's not just straight banalofamerica.com stuff. It's paranormal merchandise with a special message, and hopefully the listeners of this great program will dig it and pick up some of the merchandise and help throw some change into the bucket of BOA so we can keep the franchise growing and evolving in the weeks, months, and years to come. Stay tuned to BenallofAmerica.com this coming Friday, Black Friday, for the BOA line's grand unveiling. Last bit of business we have to take care of, and that's the preview for next week's program. This one is going to be an awesome episode. It is the first two-parter of the season. Our guest is Keith Chester, author of Strange Company, Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II, which details the often overlooked but critically important Foo Fighter era in ufology. In this installment, we're going to cover the surprising variety of actual Foo Fighter objects that were reported to be seen, how the Allied forces investigated the Foo Fighters, notable figures from that era, ten key Foo Fighter cases will be discussed in detail, and we'll be covering the explosion of the Foo Fighter story on American shores. And all that is just part one of this marathon conversation. This is an intensely thorough edition of BOA Audio. We are almost guaranteed to walk away having heard something new, and it definitely constitutes a must-hear episode for any serious student of ufology. Keith Chester, part one of two, talking about strange company, military encounters with UFOs in World War II the Foo Fighter era of ufology in tremendous detail, top to bottom, next week on Been All of America Audio Season 3. And on that note, there's not much left to say, my friends. I want to wish all of our great American listeners a fantastic Thanksgiving holiday. Have a wonderful time with your families. Enjoy the meals. Enjoy the time to kick back and relax. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. We'll be back next week with more underground esoteric audio as only BOA can provide. Until then, this is Tim Benall, thanking you for listening and signing off.